Can everybody hear me? Okay. My name is Claire Wilkins, and I work with Ibogaine. And I just, first of all, want to share that yesterday was my 40th birthday. <laughs> to be here and presenting on Ibogaine, on the work that we've done, and to be around my family, my new found family, is such an incredible experience, especially considering that 10 years ago, when I turned 30, I was living with my mother on something called long-acting methadone, which they don't serve at the finer establishments anymore, a fifth of vodka, and uh, a pint of haagen ice cream pretty much every day. And so it's a little different <laughs> this birthday. So thank you for having me. I'm going to go right into the, um, into the presentation. Uh, Pangea is an inpatient detox service for men and women uh, aged 18 to 72. Our oldest client was my father, who was 72 years old when he came to take the medicine. And a lot of these clients have a history of homelessness, domestic violence, mental disorders, physical disease, substance misuse, and social exclusion. Of course, they are incredibly highly functioning as well, which is a testament to their uh, endurance and uh, strength of character to be able to deal with these kinds of situations and also hold the other, you know, a regular full-time job, not to mention the full-time, no benefits, double-time, overtime job of managing a dependency. Um, Ibogaine is a naturally occurring alkaloid that comes from Gabon. Uh, we use, at our clinic, we use Ibogaine extract uh, 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 in, three, in, in two ways. Uh, we use the root bark. We also use total alkaloid extract, and we use the ibogaine hydrochloride. We use three different versions of the medicine. And it's used in Gabon for initiation and rites and passage, and also for physical and emotional healing. Um, it was not really discovered. Um, its anti-addictive properties were not really discovered until Howard Lotsoff took the medicine, whom I also want to take a moment to honor, who is not here with us. And if he were alive, he certainly would be here right up until the end. He was at conferences, on the phone, doing work, and his wife, Norma Lotsoff. Norma, are you here? Where is she? I love you, Norma. <laughs> Thank you so much. Howard is my spiritual father. Howard came along in my life and put, scooped me under his wing, and I wouldn't be here speaking. I can't stand speaking in public, and, uh, you know, I, it's, it's very difficult for me to even uh, want to share my story, and for him it was very important that uh, for the work, for Ibogaine, um, that we do share this information. And so it was with, with, without him, I, I wouldn't even be off drugs, much less standing here and sharing this information about many other people who've been able to come off severe dependencies. Um, and <clears throat> we're going to be talking about what happens when you take Ibogaine. Do, there's, do you take it once and then all of a sudden you're not an addict? Is that what happens? Uh, there's this sort of mythological, you know, aspect to Ibogaine where in one night, you take it, it's like 20 years of psychotherapy, and the next morning, you're not even thinking about opiates that were running your life or crystal meth that was, you know, destroying your family for many, many years. You're not an addict anymore. Now, what I, there are cases like that where people come out of an Ibogaine experience overnight completely free of dependencies and not wanting to engage in any kind of self-harming behavior like they were before. But addiction is a chronic issue. This is something that's systemic, it's societal, it's global. And we all deal with it, not just people who are shooting up heroin. You, who had your had to have your coffee this morning, whoever you were, you know, that, that, that we all deal with, with addiction on many, many, many different levels. So we started looking at abstinence and um, there's no clear consensus really on what abstinence is. And we started look, trying to get, you know, data from detoxes and, and rehabs as to how many people were leaving their, their, their rehabs free and clear of the substances that they were coming in to be off of. And in um, the National Treat Come Outcome Research Project in England and the Drug Outcome Research Project in Scotland, um, they had conflicting ideas. The definition of drug-free was users who can find their drug use to substitute medication, for one, which is like Suboxone, Subutex, Buprenorphine, Methadone. And then another definition was an individual being totally drug-free other than alcohol and tobacco use for a period of 90 days prior to their research interview. And so for me, who, you know, 
um, drank in the morning before breakfast, um, I don't. I wouldn't have considered myself uh, cl uh, clean after um, you know getting out of treatment if I was still drinking alcohol. So, what 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 are these lessons that we're learning? What what is what 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 what's happening? And more and more people are on substitute prescribing and less completely abstinent. We're seeing more of this. Even long-acting opiates like Suboxone and Subutex are used in the detox process. Um, and so people are leaving detoxes with habits. This is a growing and growing. Um, in the UK, methadone is prescribed as a harm reduction strategy when you leave jail. So we're having to really look at what is going on for people chemically and what is harm reduction, what is their quality of life, um, and what helps them. Um, 14,656 substance misusers treated over a period of six months and not a single person is reported as leaving the program drug-free, and that was from Addiction Today in 2009. Um, <laughs> sorry, I can't see this slide here. Um, so what does clean mean? And in Narcotics Anonymous, the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop using, where clean is defined as complete abstinence from mood, mood and mind-altering substances, including alcohol and marijuana. And for me, when I went into a 12-step model treatment for my opiate use, it was extremely, extremely surprising to me that I would have to give up my cannabis use. That was a huge shocker and uh, in order to fit into that paradigm. And that is for a lot of people. For a lot of people, cannabis helps with chronic pain, and it's not a substance of detriment in their lives nor in their families' lives. And this is an important issue because this comes up all the time when I deal with family members. He's not clean. He's smoking pot. I can smell the pot in the backyard. And having to educate about this whole spectrum of um, drug use. Um, so with harm reduction, it dilutes the focus on abstinence and encourages more us to, to realize that you know we, we're all drug users in a sense and we all need to, this is my belief really, that, that we, we really need to open up and discuss the medicines that we are all taking and not focus so much on the addict and the chemically dependent one. It's the, usually the illicit chemically dependent one that we focus on and, what, and asking them to be clean, which is also I think a derogatory term, you know, because what it is clean and the opposite of clean is dirty and there's all these puritanical notions associated with that and it's it's really really tough for people who are going through um, dependencies when they're dealing with so many things that they had to do just in order to maintain their their habit like people steal you know and um, pe people commit crimes and there's a lot of shame and there's an incredible amount of guilt just to get their medicine or their drug and if you're not um, a legal drug user, that shame, usually the best thing or the only thing that can repair that shame is more of the drug. That's what it was like for me each day, just more of the drug, that's what helped. Um, so does Ibogaine set, this, set the scene for complete abstinence? That's an important question to acknowledge. And I believe it does. I, there are people who are com completely abstinent from their, their, their main drug of choice. Um, the, this is our data. This is we uh, in our clients. 76% uh, of our clients are opiate users. 32% stimulants. 26% nicotine. 28% benzodiazepine. 20% alcohol. 10% antidepressants. And the reason why I include antidepressants on that because there are a lot of people who want to detox off antidepressants who have a great deal of trouble um, actually, you know, repairing their depression with antidepressants. They have they have more issues to deal with that um, are challenging rather than the repair, and so we help people with that as well. Over 50% of our clients are poly substance users. Um, this is also really important here, uh, what we're dealing with underneath the addiction, because it's not just the addiction, that is just one aspect of an entire human being. We're dealing with chronic pain, 19% of our clients have chronic pain, and I actually think that that number is even higher. These are clients that label themselves as having chronic pain. There are many, many, many people who have dealt with the chronic pain um, and, aren't, and aren't getting surgeries or aren't in that whole loop of you know, going to pain doctors and all of that, but they have pain issues that surface. Many of them don't even know. It surfaces only after you remove the drugs and the pain becomes aware, and that's an important thing, assessing 
you know, the chronic pain. And they have, there's a lot of comorbidities. At our clinic, we are a medically supported clinic, and so we deal with people who are much more compromised physically, and so we're dealing with cardiovascular conditions, diabetes, obesity, emphysema, migraines. Um, and depression is huge. Depression is something that we really want to look at with um, addiction. There's a huge correlation, and I start talking to clients about it right away. I want to find out if they have a history of chronic depression or a history of chronic PTSD uh, or history of PTSD or chronic anxiety, because these are things we know are going to emerge during the treatment. And first of all, is the client even aware of it? Are they, are they tackling it? How are they looking at it? What have they been doing aside from just taking a substance that they thought was helping and that helped for a while and then was now causing greater harm? So at our clinic, we, um, we do an assessment that includes a thorough you know, medical history and family history. We also assess um, their nutrition, how they eat. Uh, this is gargantuan for me, and it, it was hu in, in my own evolution. I mean, I told you about the, the tubs of, of, of ice cream and, 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 and the vodka, and, you know, and we get people who come in and we say, what is, what is your diet? And it's like coffee and gummy worms. You know, it's 3 p.m., more coffee, more gummy worms. And, uh, and, and, and so you're dealing with very, very malnourished population. And um, uh, so at our clinic, we focus a lot on nutrition. We use almost all organic food, and we do a lot of nutritional support with IVs and supplements and with food as medicine. And we're, we're, we're teaching people this. And this is one of the main um, aspects in successful outcomes, which I'll get to a little later as well, and what people credit is shifting in what they're putting into their bodies. You're taking out crystal meth, you're taking out crack, you're taking out methadone. What are you putting in? And how can that heal you? How can that rever can, can it reverse disease? Yes, it can. Um, and then we, you know, we do our intervention, which is the treatment, which is ibogaine. It's an addiction interrupter. Uh, Dimitri, who I think is here, also calls it the relationship interrupter. Uh, you know, you take uh, ibogaine, you look at yourself, you take a, 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 a deep inquiry into your life, and you start looking at not just your addictions and what you want to interrupt, but anything that's not serving you. And this is a tough thing to do. This is a noble path. This is like it's not just oh, it's just this dependency. If I could just get the physical and ke you know chemical dependency out of the way, it. That would be great. That would just make you know this job so easy. But it's not. It's all the underlying issues, and relationships are at the core of that. Our relationships with ourselves, and that's what I really love about ibogaine. And I, ibogaine, I believe, helps us fall back in love with ourselves and fall back in love with each other. And I believe psychedelics and entheogens do that too. It brings love back into the equation. I think more and more we need to keep talking about that. Um, so we have a 10-day minimum detox up to a three-week detox, and that means that we treat people, you know, in a, in a whole range of ways. Um, some people come in, like I said, have that overnight sensation, you know, one-shot wonder. There's someone here in the audience tonight who took Ibogaine once for a crystal meth habit, and four years later, he's still not doing crystal meth. I mean, that's an incredible feat. Um, that is the rare, you know, uh, client. Uh, there are more people who require a lot more work. Not that this, that gentleman didn't do his work, but that you have physical dependencies in a different, in, in, and you have emotional um, inabilities, emotional immaturities. There's so much that 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 comes up in a in a, in a detox. So with dosing, we have various ways that we dose, and we've really kind of had a lot of success actually with slower dosing and lower dosing protocol and what that does is it brings up the issue of you know um, booster therapy which I'll bring up also in, in success when we talk about people who've had success and how we work with supplemental smaller doses of Ibogaine and how people get access to that as well. We monitor people and we do follow-up um, with we have an aftercare facility that, that we started um, and that's something that's a big, you know, that was, was always a big hole in Ibogaine treatment. Usually when people go to traditional rehab, it's 30 days or 90 days or sometimes even a year. With Ibogaine, it was, oh, it's this overnight thing. You come for three days, you do your Ibogaine, boom, and you go back home, and it's, okay, great. You get a, quite a bit of brain repair. You get quite a bit. You get your addiction in interrupted, but then there's your whole life. You're off drugs, so now what? You know, and so communicating with the family, communicating with the clients, and then coming up with measures so that we can measure what it is that, you know, is coming up for people and how they're able to deal with it, what, how, how they're able to deal with their depression. Did the Ibogaine help their depression? Beck inventories. This is where MAPS comes in. 
we have been working with MAPS for a while and we've finally got a protocol that has put together all of the um, measures that we believe will be tracking people over a long period of time where they're assessing their quality of life, where they're assessing their addiction severity, where they're assessing their depression, and what is contributing to the increase or decrease in those factors and that will convince even the most dubious of, of, of skeptics. So that, that's been a, a, a lot of work and I'm really excited. Our, our first three um, uh, clients that are, we're starting up again with the study are is this coming Monday. So, um, the University of Kent. More, more, more people are, are approaching us about um, research. They heard what we, about what we were doing with nutrition. They heard about ibogaine and, and cognition, and they have come to us and they are developing a protocol on studying ibogaine and its effects on cognition as well as nutrition as an, with, as an adjunct, which I consider ibogaine as nutrition. <laughs> Profound root nutrition. <laughs> um, so detox and outcome, what is the client's intention? What is support and what is an agenda? You know, this whole idea of being clean, come in, get off all your drugs. I mean, I even heard about an ibogaine provider telling the client to leave your cigarettes at home. You won't need them when you're done here. And it's, hey, 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 calm down. That person ended up being on nine different substances, which including mood stabilizers, benzodiazepines, opiates, Adderall as a stimulant, and not to mention nicotine and you know, a couple others, trazodone. And so you, know, you want to look at what is the client's intention. Not my, not, not my intention. For some people, benzos like Xanax or Valium really help them with severe chronic anxiety get through their, their, their day. I, I had a benzodiazepine habit and it was very, very difficult to, to get through in the practice that it takes to walk through life being totally shit scared is really, really difficult without you know, a support, a medical support. And um, teaching people how to do that and learning how to do that is, is it's not, we, we're, we don't learn how to breathe, you know? We don't just learn how to be in our bodies. And so a whole shift in being has to happen that is predicated by what the person intends to do and how they intend to deal with it. Because when you're trying to come off drugs, essentially what you're doing is you're taking someone who like has a prosthetic and taking their prosthetic leg away and going, it's cool, just hop around on your leg. I know the prosthetic worked great for a really long time, but you can do without it and figuring out, yeah, just hop. Yeah, I'll show you how to hop better. And it's like, no, you know, a lot of people are really, really highly functioning. The opiates, the reason why they're seeking out opiates or the reason why they're seeking out co you know, cocaine is to repair something in the brain. They need more dopamine. They need more endorphins so that they can function. And they're doing a great job of it for many, many years. You take it away and then all of a sudden it gets very messy. Life gets really messy and hard and unpredictable and mysterious after you get off your you know, the drug that's been helping you the most. It really, really does. And I tell that to clients that call me. Yes, it's not just, it's great to be not having to, you know, score every day or go to a methadone clinic or, you know, uh, prostitute yourself for your, your medicine. But what happens is that's what a lot of people only know. That's, and then you have to learn how to live life with help that maybe, or maybe some people still want a prostitute. I've dealt with that. Maybe some people still want to deal drugs. That's all they know how to do. And how do you teach someone or how do you show someone to continue to deal drugs as their only source of income without taking the drugs? So lots and lots of questions, you know. Um, and that's the longer conversation about the spectrum of drug use and what that mean, means for everyone. 92% of clients leave our clinic free from the dependencies of their choice. And that means the majority of the people who come through our clinic detox at our clinic and are done with the dependencies that they've decided to eliminate while they're there. There are some people who leave mid-treatment or go, you know what, I can't deal. One guy said to me, I'd rather be a junker. I'd rather live in my, my parents' basement and sell oxys. That, and just that's what, and there's no judgment on that. You know, it's like, okay, I completely understand. I'm amazed people even make it down to Tijuana to even get there in the first place. So um, outcome, I don't think that the slide, you can see it, but outcome is engagement, not abstinence. Yeah, you can see it on the slide. That's what I really wanted to make a point of. Outcome is engagement, not abstinence. You're engaging more in life. What are you saying yes to? Instead of what are you saying? No heroin. People say, oh, because if only no heroin, only if I know shooting up. But what are you going to say yes to? Because if all your life is spent saying no to something, you're still saying no to that giant thing. What are you going to start saying yes to? What are your passions? What do you care about? You know, if you're going to give up drugs that really made you feel good, it better be worth it. 
you know? Some success here, 18% uh, of clients are free from their primary substance abuse from six months after treatment or more, and that's up to four years. Wes Bennett is here tonight. Where I saw you, he's here, yeah. Wes was the person I was talking about, did a treatment for crystal methamphetamine four years ago, and serendipitously is here for this conference. I just, what a great birthday present. <laughs> and so he's one of our, our you know, four years, no, you know, and, um, and then there are other people during that, that, the, 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 um, that period of time who have been able to stay free and clear of the drug that they chose, which usually it's methadone, it's the longer acting ones, people who um, have had many, 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 many years um, of career, it's career uh, um, uh, clients. <laughs> um, and they really make giant shifts. 42% of clients use the primary substance within three months, okay? I almost say it's like 50-50, it's like you come in and you do Ibogaine and it's, 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 it's very highly likely that you're gonna go back out and do that. Now, why does that happen? Even though Ibogaine comes and interrupts your dependency and does a lot of brain repair, um, repairs your opiate receptors, takes cravings away, why would people, you know, after doing this really intensive uh, program, go and use, because that's what their bodies know how to do. I mean, I'm amazed. We One guy who's clean, who never, didn't go back, with 39 years of methadone. I mean, 39 years. That's what all his body knew how to do, and he's still, figuring out sleeping, you know, like nine, ten months later or something like that. He's still figuring out sleeping. But, um, you know, it's really tough. You're essentially going upstream when you're deciding to live your life without the, the, the substance that assisted you so much. It's learning a whole new skill set. It's learning numerous skill sets. Um, Ibogaine equals brain repair, insight, shame washing, <laughs> empowerment, reawakening, and the body intelligence. I, um, I mention this because these are all of the things that can happen with Ibogaine that people talk about. You're, they feel like their, their brain is better. They don't want the things that harmed them before. They have insight into a lot of their choices. Shame washing, I don't know, Ken, if you can talk about the, the you know, mechanism of action for shame washing, but there's actually, without even talking and without even a therapeutic process, a, a, a cleansing of shame that people feel post Ibogaine. I can certainly attest to that. I had done a lot of things in my life that I w was not happy about, and every single night, even years after I had done them, would process, oh God, oh God, you know, and it's with Ibogaine, it, it, it essentially opens up that part of you where you accept yourself. There's a giant acceptance of you completely, you as a whole being. And all my life, I defined myself as an addict and broken and needing to be fixed. Hi, my name is Claire, I'm an addict, I'm an addict. And it was, it was so much greater than that. The story was so much larger. And I think that that's something to really look into. Um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Other factors in successful outcomes. Med the medicine, understanding your allies. What is in your pharmacopoeia? Okay, this I get, I start, gets, I talk with clients and, and family members about this right away because it, usually it's the family member or the husband or the wife. It's like, yeah, he's just got to be clean. You got to be clean or he's going to move out or I got to get clean before school and I got to, and it's like, okay, well, what, this worked for you and what are we dealing with? If you're dealing with physical pain, what are you going to use for your physical pain? You know? Um, and uh, also, who are your friends? And are, are you a drug dealer? And access to boosters. This is huge. Access to the medicine. What do you do when the medicine that helps you the most with your condition is illegal? And, you know, so we've got, like, grandmas on Ibogaine now. We have, we, this is, life is changing here a lot. This, the society is changing a lot here where people are taking the power of healing themselves back into their own hands and actually willing to risk, you know, committing felonies so that they can treat themselves. And to me, that's a really, really, really honorable um, uh, process that I witness all the time, what people are willing to go through just, just to feel relief, just to feel relief, and actually to engage in evolution. And it's so rare that we do that. Usually we want the quick, easy fix. Addicts want the quick, easy fix. Um, but what makes success, people, people who are successful, you know, in life and happier in life are people who 
come to an awareness and an acceptance that they have certain conditions that they're dealing with and it's going to keep coming up, you're going to find the crack pipe in your, you know, uh, girlfriend's robe and you're going to have it in your hand. And what are you going to do about that? You know, um, you're going to get offered drugs. Uh, you're going to need a root canal, you know. Um, you're going to think you can drink again like I did. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work out at all. I had to have, have an intervention and Ibogaine treatment myself, and thank God that that worked out. Um, repairing the family, the, the, the family dynamic and compute community support. There's this whole notion of like putting you know, the, the, the addict into treatment and getting the addict treated, and that's not the case. The family needs to be treated unless we start dealing with the whole family. And we're doing it more and more, and we have more group groups, and it's hard because you know, it's only with people who are nearby. We've had certain people fly in from different places like Canada and Venezuela to be with their families and work with them, but that's the rare case. Um, but getting the family involved and getting them to own up and honor, you know, their dependencies. What can you live without? You're so focused on this guy. Imagine this is the one thing that helped him get to work every day. This is the one thing that enabled him to able to be talked to a girl every day. You know, what can't you live without just, you know, to do your homework? You know, like, or, you know, like it's like gasoline in the car here. We, we, we look, we're changing energies and we've got to really be, you know, we, we need each other's minds and each other's support um, and to be on the same page with each other and share, not make the addict so different, the other, the other, you know. Um, redefining nutrition and nurturing, brain repair, self-care, self-harm, huge thing for me. I grew up in a really violent household, PTSD, all sorts of things like that, um, and learned how to hurt myself. I learned, I didn't feel deserving, and a lot of addicts are like that. They have a lot of violence, a lot of sexual trauma, a lot of old wounds, and they don't know how to nourish themselves. The nourishment is the chemical. The nourishment is, as crazy as it sounds, spiking your vein with cocaine or whatever is the nourishment. And that's, and so changing the whole discussion around nourishment. Fortunately, Ibogaine is such a wonderful substance, it actually starts to calibrate your brain so that you crave things that do nourish you. But for many people, you still need to engage in that with your family and your society and start talk, creating the whole conversation about nourishment and love. And this is, hey, this is what I need. I need you to be gentler with me, you know, when we talk, you know, or maybe, you know. And for me, I've had to learn that very much so. I came up, grew up with a lot of violence and I had to really learn to be softer w with myself and, and am learning <laughs> to be softer with others too, you know. We're, we're such a tough, tough society, especially with addicts and, and addicts on ourselves. And then treating the underlying core issues here, sexual, physical trauma, I talked about this. Yeah, we went, went into that. So, you know, this is um, uh, a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited that we are here to talk about it because I, I really want to talk more about how, what are all the other adjunct things we need to do in addition to Ibogaine. Ibogaine is a wonderful thing. I mean, where people can detox, we have over 90% of our clients leaving detoxed when the average treatment, you know, rehab is about one third of their clients leave actually detoxed in the U.S. I mean, that's just that alone. Just getting clear, just, and I remember saying when certain friends that I was able to treat, God, if just he could be, you know, away for, from crystal meth just for a couple days, I just want to see what that would be like for him, and he, if, if he can be okay with that, and in his body, and learning to be, and then watching people flower and go, hey man, I, I can be in this body, I don't need that, and that, that's just a really beautiful thing. One day, one day of learning to explore our bodies, you know, um, this is a quote that I'd like to end with from Gabor Mate, who says, misplaced attachment to what cannot satiate the soul is not an error exclusive to addicts, but is the common condition of mankind. And I really like that a lot. I really think that we need to connect more on that. As I was mentioning earlier, we focus on the addict. What are you doing? How could you do that? You know, oh my God, oh, that's awful. And, but we have our, all have our own versions of, of, of trying to satiate you know, that yearning. And the more that we can find that place in ourselves, the more that we can connect with drug users and understand them better, because that's what they're looking for as well, as, well, as just the understanding, to feel okay, to feel okay in my body and, and, and for acceptance. The only change that can ever happen is through acceptance first. So, and that's it. <laughs> Wow. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Claire. Uh, the microphone. Um, so questions for Claire. Yes. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, what happens in the brain with ibogaine? What's known about the actual chemical and neurological processes that yeah, I, I I can tell you, and and I can I, I'll tell you that the, the Ken Alper, who knows best as, as far as the, the the people in the audience here, than, better than anybody, um, the last slide in his presentation was we don't know <laughs> the mechanism of action, but yeah, I will tell you what we do know. We do know that ibogaine comes in and it doesn't work like an opiate agonist, like as far as methadone or an, like another opiate, and come in and act like another opiate in your in your brain, but it has qualities that make you feel like it does. So you actually go through um, the process without feeling withdrawal. And so what they're saying is that Ibogaine comes in and works on the receptors and actually starts repairing the receptors. It doesn't, it acts like the substance that you, you you're used to inge ingesting in many ways, especially with opiates, but what it does is it starts actually repairing the receptors there, and it increases the GDNF, which is the glial-derived nerve growth factor, which is what is produced when you're exercising really, really hard, and so it increases dopamine, it increases serotonin, and this is something that people are looking for in their drugs. They're looking for more serotonin, and you, and you get you, you deal with you know de depression, people coming out of depression and things like that. With not, I want to really be clear about that though. With chronic depression and any chronic issues, ibogaine does not solve it. Okay, these are lifelong issues that need you know a whole range of of, of care. Thank you. Other questions. Uh, when you give the ibogaine, um, aside from the issues of withdrawal from the substances that people have been using, what sorts of medical complications do you get? When, when you, after giving at the her? clinic, when you give ibogaine, mm -hmm. um, what kinds of medical concerns beyond those of withdrawal do you find that you have? Okay, well, the first concern would be mortality. You want to make sure you keep the client alive. Okay? And... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and 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 then secondly, you want to keep them safe. Um, and so some of the issues are there are people who have underlying issues such as seizures or epilepsy or other dependencies that they are they haven't shared with you. We had that happen in the first you know year where people we were realizing that people weren't really sharing as much about their alcohol or their benzodiazepine use, and seizures would occur. And so what we started doing was we started doing drug tests along with all of our lab tests, and not because we didn't trust them, but just so that we could get an accurate, and so if we, because sometimes people do, don't remember that they used cocaine the day before, or sometimes people don't know it's in the drug, there, there's cocaine and heroin, you know, it's, it happens. Um, so you're looking at that, um, you're also looking at pe people feeling uncomfortable, that's something that can happen, because you can give Ibogaine, it doesn't necessarily take all the discomfort of withdrawal away, and uncomfortable means uncomfortable emotionally and uncomfortable physically, and so that's why a support group a team is who knows what they're doing medically and then also emotionally is so vital, and I think that it's critical that someone who has taken Ibogaine is around someone who is taking Ibogaine. Who's next? Um, hi. So have you had uh, any experience with ibogaine in treating any other psychological issues um, in patients uh, beyond those who are being treated for addiction, like um, disorders in the OCD spectrum? OCD, did you say? Yes. Or any other? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't have, I, I haven't actually had someone come in as a client and say, I would like to take ibogaine for my OCD and that's it. It's usually a whole slew of things and OCD is in there. And um, does ibogaine solve the issue of OCD? I don't really think so um, in the way that it interrupts chemical dependency, but just as ibogaine is the medicine of habits and patterns and it can interrupt something so severe as a chemical, you know, dependency, it makes you look at all of your habits and patterns. It really is an opportunity. Now, this is also if you're willing, and it's important to be willing to look at and willing to hear, and you're looking at deeply ingrained patterns for many, many, many years, and, and, and it's, you know, that for, for many people, um, that is a difficult process. They, there's a lot of people who really think they're going to take Ibogaine once or so, 
and then be free and clear of some serious issues. And I really want to kind of discourage that mythology because of just the tremendous amount of work I've had to do on my own. You know, I, 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 I'm averse to labeling. I'm not in any way um, credentialed to label anybody. We use it in reference. We're saying, oh, this person was labeled bipolar, or this person has bipolar-like behavior, or Asperger's, or OCD. We use it in the vernacular when we're trying to get things across. Um, but um, that brings up that whole issue, yes, of how we label ourselves, because I think we're a pretty OCD society, you know? And I think that we really need to look at that. We really need to look at what is okay. And a lot of it, of what I've come across is that people have these ways of being that they've developed that have allowed them to survive some of the most traumatic circumstances where one would normally you know, attempt suicide or, 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 or completely retreat from society. And so we need to look at also the functioning ability of what these things are and why we do them. But yes, you know, to answer your question, yes, we, we have treated people who are classified as OCD and, and we do see, I mean, PTSD is something we see great, tremendous results with. Uh, uh, very interesting talk, um, made a, a, a lot of great points. Um, and I'm, I really like to see, I, I like that the fact that you're collecting outcome measure data. Um, my question specifically um, is I want to hear a little bit more about um, the specifics of opioid substitution therapy and particularly what's discussed with the, with the participant coming in. And even more, um, even more specifically, have you ever said, you know, sounds like you're doing good on methadone, oh, maybe yeah. you don't need this. And just for those that don't know, I think it's a very important point though. In, there are no stronger data in the harm reduction of drug abuse and addiction than the clinical efficacy of methadone. Dozens upon dozens upon dozens of studies have shown that HIV plummets, crime plummets, employment increases. It's one of the most powerful tools in our toolbox. And, and, and buprenorphine is an incredible drug too, um, with a lot of promise, um, some benefits over, over methadone. So I just want to you know, kind of speak up. I, I thought it might have, you know, be sense of maybe, an, you know, a, a bias against opioid substitution. So I want to hear more about that. I'm, I'm not averse to how anybody wants, oops, excuse me, oops. I'm not averse to how anybody wants to use the drugs in their system. As I was on methadone for eight and a half years. And it's how I got, I had abscesses in my arms. I had legal issues, health issues, uh, financial issues uh, with heroin. And methadone basically saved my life, you know. And um, so, yes, and there are people, we're just, we're just dealing with this. We just dealt with this. A gentleman who, um, he came in for a treatment with us, and he got off his heroin, and he also had a benzodiazepine habit, and he went back to go and live his life. And it was very hard being so awake and so aware for him. And he ended up getting on Suboxone, and through Suboxone, he got a great job. He saved up money. He got a girlfriend that was very different from the old, you know, drama mamas that he was used to. And, I mean, his life was fantastic. And he called me, and he goes, yeah, I'm ready to do Ibogaine again. And I'm like, why? <laughs> Let's talk about why. Are you ready? Are you, do you want, I really, he, and, and people want to be delivered from chemical slavery. That's what they want when they're deciding to come and, like, get off something, you know, and it's, it, that's a different attitude than when you're looking at something as, like I said, the prosthetic that helps you, I mean, you're legless without the prosthetic, right? For me, I, my life got so much better, and there's, there have been several people who, in mid-treatment, I've even said, and we have that medicine, we don't let people leave the clinic and go and find their own opiates or whatever, that's another really important thing, and that, you know, we don't want people just rushing out and going and um, harming themselves, uh, deciding to get back on an opiate, we want to really, we, we discussed that, yes, thank you for mentioning it, it's a very, very important point. Um, one more question from this little cluster, I'll get another part of the room. Hi, um, you had mentioned in your presentation that um, approximately 42% of addicts reuse after about three months. I was wondering if you have looked into or, or researched the idea of uh, Ibogaine um, maintenance treatment. There are people all over the United States right now who are, you know, taking root bark um, as a maintenance treatment. Um, this is really important to note. There are people who have called me and said, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have access to that medicine because 
my husband left me, and my house went into foreclosure, and all I wanted to do was go to my doctor who didn't, who, you know, there are people, there are a lot of doctors say, you know, oh, Ibogaine, they, first of all, many are not aware of Ibogaine, and many, you know, discourage it if they're not aware of it, so they don't have their own physician's support. And it's really difficult to be in a situation where you go out of the country or do it in the country legally, and then you're trying to continue to evolve and trying to work through really traumatic situations, and you don't have access to the medicine that really helped you in the first place. And so, yes, I firmly believe in that. I am an, an example of Ibogaine maintenance. I regularly use boosters probably every few months or so, and also root bark. Um, we use root, root, root bark, we do root bark smoothies, which are really, 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 really small doses of it. And it's like a jamba juice, an iboga jamba juice smoothie, kind of, really. And, um, and works on your brain. You feel the brain repair. You feel the decrease in cravings, you know. And um, yeah, there's, it's, it's shifting. Things are changing, and people are taking their own healing back into their own hands. Yay. All right, I think we have time for maybe one last question. Um, gentleman over here has been waiting, I know. Hello, miss. Uh, your uh, yes. Hello, miss. Uh, your story makes me uh, very happy to hear it, filled me with hope. Uh, second, um, um, how significant do you find that the therapists take the medicine to successfully guide the patient through the treatment I know that the question has been posed before, and I don't want to hammer it. For you are operating outside the U.S., you might be freer to discuss that question. Um, in, in my question now is to this, there is the question of language when establishing the connection between the psychedelic state and the success of the, of the uh, treatment, right? Uh, why does particularly the psychedelic state work and not others, or better than others, right? Now, we may use the description of the patients of their, uh, of their trip, or however you want to call it, but these descriptions, of course, occur through language when a lot of the experience of the psychedelic state of mind is nonverbal and transcends language. So then, yes, uh, do you find extremely significant or not so much? that the therapist undergoes the psychedelic state to successfully guide the patient through the treatment. Yes. Hello? Yes. Ex extremely important. When, when I did my treatment for Ibogaine, there was no one at the facility who had used Ibogaine or any kind of entheogen and um, was not aware of Ibogaine therapy as it is. It's, this is a developing field here, okay? And we're learning, and I really want to thank all of these 400 treatments, these, these people who have given me my schooling, you know, who have given me my education and allowed me to make mistakes, you know, and learn through these processes with them. And, uh, but yes, I think it's critical just from watching what people, how people are and how they behave and that separation that I was talking about earlier, that separation. And, you know, in the Western medical model, it's doctor, patient. You can't even hug your patient. You can't even talk about your own personal issues. And that's the opposite of what we do down at our place. And I have to actually try and deprogram doctors and get them to be okay with talking about it. it's it's a whole process we're really trying to attract people that are actively actively interested in, in this medicine and how it transformed themselves because then you permeate it they can feel that you know junkies can smell a bullshit artist from three miles away man you know it's like if you if you're just there thinking you're doing your little job oh I'm here to help you no what are you doing about you they want to know what you're doing about you you have to get real and get on the level with them because you're going they're going to go through a, a sort of personal hell and heaven too hopefully so yes i think it's very important i mean and to, to explain, to be able to, and like you were talking about, having that language of understanding with the visions and the dreaming and um, uh, archetypes, uh, all of that is extremely important. Watch, I watched a gentleman come out of prison um, who was a, a, a white power uh, guy, and he was bathed in his visions by Bwiti women the entire time. And he came out of the whole experience extremely shifted and 
so talking about that and what that meant for him and him being able to kind of handle that and go back home, you know, with his lace up black boots and all of that and like kind of, you know, I mean, there's rebirths that are happening and so learning how to midwife that with your, through your own process is critical. Yes, thanks for asking that. Okay, so that's it for the questions for now. We have, let's thank Claire again, please. <laughs>